Welcome back class to this lecture about the visual elements and art concepts. This is the video lecture for module two. So let's talk briefly about your objectives for this module. By using visual examples, uh, you're going to define and discuss the visual elements of design. Um, and you're also going to identify and discuss the differences between representational art, abstract art, and non-representational art. And uh, you'll also be able to explain the differences between form and content of visual examples. So before we move into the meat of this lecture, let's go over the Module 2 checklist. First, you have your assigned readings from Chapter 1, which include Sections 1.4 through 1.6, and all of Chapter 3. You'll be responsible for watching this video and taking lecture notes and responding to the question prompts at the end of the video and also um, featured under the video in the module. And of course, you'll have to uh, participate in the discussion uh, about your reading, um, in which you'll complete an, an initial post, citing the reading at least twice, using those in-text citations, and then you have to uh, respond to two of your classmates' posts as well. Um, and be sure to respond fully and clearly to the discussion prompts, okay? And check that syllabus for when you're required to post your initial response and make sure that you get in the remaining responses to your classmates by the module deadline. Um, and then don't forget you have your short essay worksheet for this module. This is not a normal essay. You won't have uh, an introduction or a conclusion, um, but you will be responsible for writing um, concise paragraphs about each of the visual elements um, relating to the specific works of art that you've selected from the Metropolitan Museum of Art website. And you'll need to cite your reading in each of those paragraphs at least once using an in-text citation. You'll also be responsible for, complete, for completing the works cited page um, at the end of the assignment. And of course, there are more detailed instructions in the um, assignment uh, and instructions uh, and rubrics pages in Canvas. So don't forget that you also must download and utilize the Microsoft Word template provided for you to complete this assignment. Also, a few gentle reminders. Be aware of that plagiarism policy. Students, you will not be given credit if you do not cite the sources um, from where you from which you get your information. Okay, um, this means that you must include cita citations for quotations, paraphrased statements and or passages, um, and completely rewritten sentences or paragraphs. You have to remember that if you borrow an idea or a concept. Um, from another source, no matter how much you rewrite that, it has to be cited. Um, please also keep in mind that the majority of the writing should be in your own words. A few quotations carefully selected here and there are perfectly acceptable, but if every other statement is a quotation, um, how am I to know that you understand the material? Um, make sure that most of the writing is in your own words. And don't forget that you need to be using MLA style to format your citations, both in text and for in reference. And I've even included um, the in text citations for your textbook as they should appear here. This is just one example referring to section 1.3. Um, since you don't have a physical textbook, that's why you don't have page numbers here. You have section numbers instead and then how to format that in reference um, for your textbook uh, is right here. You'll also find these within Canvas in various places, okay? 
like in your assignment instructions and rubrics. Um, and don't forget to utilize the writing and citation help pages um, that are also uh, repeatedly linked throughout your modules, throughout Canvas. Um, take advantage of those resources if you forget how to cite an artwork or if you want to brush up on how to write about art. Um, those resources are available to you. So, why do we discuss the visual elements of art? Well, for many viewers, one of the most daunting or frustrating aspects of art is trying to describe what they see. By discussing the visual elements of art, we become familiar with the vocabulary of the language of art and design. We come to understand that artists carefully use these elements, line, shape, mass, space, time, motion, light, color, and texture to create very diverse images, sculptures, and architectural structures, to name a few. So by learning these fundamentals of art and design, you can learn how to talk about all different kinds of art. This is the vocabulary that's used by artists, by art connoisseurs, art critics, museum professionals, um, all to illustrate how a work of art conveys meaning through form. How do artists use the unique expressive qualities of each of these visual elements? Well, your book opens this uh, whole chapter, chapter three that is, with a formal analysis of uh, Edward Hopper's uh, New York movie. So what is a formal analysis? It's a specific type of visual description um, or an explanation of visual structure of the ways in which certain visual elements have been arranged and the way they function within a composition. So that is a, what a formal analysis is. So let's give that a quick try um, for Edward Hopper's New York movie from 1939. So you'll see that lines separate the walls from the ceiling. Okay, that's just one example of line. That's an actual line in the image. You see lines on the steps. Um, these are actually edges. You'll see um, lines here dividing certain sections of the wall. Lines in the railing. Lines around the movie screen. Shapes. Shapes suggest mass. So the shape of these balcony seats are quite massive. The shape reinforces the notion of mass hovering above these other seats. Um, spaces. Okay, this picture plane is divided into two um, primary spaces. You have the theater space on the left side of the composition and you have this lobby space or waiting area on the right side of the composition. Um, also, space seems to recede from the viewer. Um, the movie screen appears like it's in the back of the movie theater. It appears far in the back um, of this space. Um, the steps also seem to recede into space. Um, time and motion are uh, somewhat represented in this work of art as well. Time, um, you could, you could uh, imagine that this usher or attendant here is waiting on this movie to end. She appears to be waiting. Um, motion is suggested by the slightly blurry screen here. Um, and light works to uh, clarify the difference in the spaces in this picture plane. Um, it's dimmer on the left side in the theater area. These lights are um, emanating from beneath these balcony seats are very dim. They don't put out much light um, on the audience here. Um, the, the light in the lobby area over here by the attendant 
um, contrasts greatly with the dim light of the theater. This light is much brighter. You can see a hard shadow is formed um, here and the bright light um, shines on the attendant's face as well. Now, color contrast um, figures heavily into this uh, composition as well. Um, the dark blue jumpsuit that the attendant is wearing, or the usher, excuse me, um, contrasts greatly with the pale um, architectural elements behind her. So does this bold red curtain. It divides the space. This um, beautiful um, use of color in this composition, the deep red of the theater seats, and also the texture of the theater seats. So that was a quick rundown of uh, use of each of the visual elements in some way or another in this work of art. You can formally analyze any work of art, um, but will each work of art that you analyze uh, have an example of each of the visual elements? No. This artwork was strategically chosen by the author because it exemplifies each of the elements. So let's slide right into uh, the first element, which is line. Line is our primary means for visual communication. It is the most basic means for recording and symbolizing ideas, observations, and feelings. So this image here of uh, the handwriting uh, reinforces that notion of um, it being our primary means of recording. Lines are long, narrow marks, generally made by drawing with a tool, such as a pencil or a brush. Line can be defined as the extension of a point in which length is always greater than width. Although lines can be of various thicknesses, indicating either delicacy or strength, um, we often see lines when we look at the edges of surfaces, like on those steps in the Edward Hopper painting from the previous slide. Um, these uh, edges of surfaces are the places where one object or plane appears to end and another object or space begins. Lines also uh, sometimes appear to be paths of action. Um, or records of the energy left by moving points. Richard Long's A Line Made by Walking is quite literally um, a record of the energy left um, from uh, the path that he walked on. Mondrian's composition with red, blue, and yellow is a very clear um, example of uh, various lines across a picture plane. This slide illustrates, um, this diagram rather, illustrates the different characteristics of line. Lines can convey different moods or feelings. Um, horizontal lines can seem calm and static. This is one right here. Uh, vertical lines might seem alert or aggressive. Diagonals and curves might appear active, uh, energetic, or sensual. Um, parallel lines are balanced and harmonious. Uh, perpendicular or converging lines create a sense of force and counterforce. Lines can also create boundaries, imply volume, and indicate mass. Um, they can also be grouped to create patterns and textures or to create the appearance of light and shadow. And by varying a line's width, an artist can also make it seem to twist and turn as if it were moving in space. These two Japanese prints illustrate how differences in line can create drastically varied depictions of similar subjects. 
The kabuki actor on the left was drawn with curving, sensual lines that convey a sense of graceful, rhythmic motion. And the fabric even appears to sway gently with the figure in its dance. The image on the right depicts a figure engaged in aggressive and violent action. The angular lines create a sense of swift movement, and the fabric almost seems frozen. Its jagged outlines lend it a sharp quality that contrasts greatly with this figure on the left. While these effects are enhanced with the patterns of the figure's clothing even, um, those patterns are formed with the distinctive types of line that communicate each feeling. In other words, the flower pattern in the clothing of this female figure is created with curving lines too. And the geometric pattern in the clothing of the male figure is made with blunt geometric shapes. So each um, element of line in these works of art lend their certain mood or feeling or effect. <clears throat> so what we've just been looking at in the example of the kabuki actors are the differences in actual lines. So what do we mean by this phrase implied line? Implied lines suggest visual connections. We make these connections with our minds based on visual clues or structures established in the works of art by the artist. Just to reiterate, the implied line uh, is a line in an artwork that is not physically there, but a line that is suggested by points in the artwork. This difference is illustrated in the diagram in your book. Um, but this one, this diagram, focuses specifically on the difference in actual lines and the different types of implied lines. The artwork, the artwork on the right is by the artist Mark Chagall. I and the Village uh, was painted in 1911, and it depicts scenes of Russian Jewish village life. Um, <clears throat> One implied line in this composition connects the eye of the animal on the left um, with the eye of the man on the right. These are called sight lines. Your book illustrates the use of sight lines with a painting called Tobit Burying the Dead, but you can read more about that on your own. The circle in the center of this composition um, that ties each, each section of the artwork together is also an implied line. In this case, the implied circle is the underlying organizational structure of this work of art. <clears throat> <clears throat> You'll notice that the circle is incomplete, but our eyes trace the existing lines and the shading that indicate the circular shape, and then they fill in the rest. Kiki Smith's Ginzer illustrates another significant use of line. It's an example of a print, a type of artwork made up almost entirely of lines um, that makes little use of shading or color to create its depth and dimension. Instead, the areas of light and dark that you see are often created by the process of crosshatching or drawing lines close together to create darker uh, areas. Uh, and the further apart those lines are, um, the lighter the area seems to be. So each hair that you see on Ginzer here is made of one line, each hair. Um, the eyes and footpads appear to be slightly shaded, but um, everything else is done with line. It's pretty incredible. <coughs> Um, and there is a section, I mean, there is a video in this section of your book that illustrates this uh, process a little bit better. Um, but just to clarify, if you don't watch that video, printmaking is a process that involves a plate of some kind, in this case a metal plate, uh, into which lines are etched or literally scratched onto the surface 
to create the desired image. <clears throat> the plate is then inked, and then those lines, those etched lines, pick up the ink. So when a piece of paper is placed onto the plate and it's run through a, a printing press, the image is transferred onto the paper. So line uh, creates the elements of value in these works of art. To the right of Ginzer, you'll see an untitled engraving by Jackson Pollock at the top um, that is characteristic of his spontaneous style that's make, that makes use of both straight and curving lines. Um, and the atmosphere of this work is pretty chaotic because of the, profu the profuse uh, tangle of lines we see in it. Um, the mix of the kinds of lines seen in it, too, make it hard to clearly identify as abstract or representational, which we'll get to later. Uh, the image below that is a machine engraving by uh, the artist Joseph Albers called Transformation B. And the use of line in this work is all about the artist's interest in purity of form and geometric abstraction as it was influenced by the Bauhaus movement in Germany. Now, recording the outlines of three-dimensional shapes onto a two-dimensional picture plane or surface is a fundamental process of drawing. And it is one of the most important uses of line in art. Although line is used in the creation of three-dimensional shapes um, in sculpture as well. Your book illustrates this point with two works of art, one by Gego and one by Fred Sandback. Um, both works very literally make use of line in the third dimension. Gego's work, Reticularia, or environment, features lots of different size lines um, that are interconnected by these linking segments that fill this entire room, creating another <clears throat> quite chaotic space. And Sandback's work, um, Untitled or um, Sculptural Study, Six Part Construction, is much calmer and minimal. And um, he uses black yarn in a much, uh, in a much, in a much simpler way to create a completely different atmosphere from Gego's work. Um, and it depicts these six uh, very elegant open rectangles that stand upright in the middle of this otherwise uh, empty space. So the next visual element is shape. <clears throat> While the words shape, mass, and form are often used interchangeably, each has their own specific definition in the visual arts. Shape is usually defined as the area within the outline of an object or figure. In two dimensions, a shape is going to appear flat. It will only have height and width. In three dimensions, shape will also have mass. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so a three-dimensional shape indicates the expanse within the outer boundaries of a three-dimensional object. It has height, width, and depth. So shape is the area within an outline of an object or figure, and mass uh, indicates the expanse within the outer boundaries of a three-dimensional object. So shapes are generally grouped into two categories, either geometric or organic. And forgive me students, I don't know why my bullet points seem to have disappeared. This was um, <clears throat> looked a lot neater when I made this PowerPoint, so my apologies. Um, now geometric shapes are uh, circles, triangles, squares, rectangles. Um, you know these. 
Um, they are the most common shapes in the human-made world. These kinds of shapes are generally made with the help of instruments, like a ruler or a compass. Um, you'll see lots of geometric shapes in this bottom left image by uh, Paul Klee. It's uh, his red balloon of 1922. <clears throat> these two works of art are not in your book, but like I said, I like to kind of pepper these other images throughout our lectures. Now, organic shapes are usually irregular, um, featuring curved or rounded lines, and they, and they evoke a more relaxed, um, informal appearance, appearance um, and most naturally occurring shapes are organic. Uh, biomorphic is another word used to describe organic shapes. You'll see mostly organic shapes in this image here. And this is Picasso's Great Still Life on a Pedestal from 1931. And without being consciously aware of it, we looked at a pair, uh, comparison of uh, these kinds of shapes already when we were looking at the two Japanese woodcut prints. Lines were the building blocks that those shapes were constructed from. So, of course, the one, uh, the female figure was the more organic, <clears throat> and then the male figure exemplified um, the geometric shapes. So, when a shape appears on a picture plane, or the flat two-dimensional picture surface, it creates a shape out of the background area as well. Um, the dominant shapes in a composition are referred to as figures or positive shapes. Um, the background areas are referred to as ground or negative shapes. Um, for instance, in the shape of space diagram you see here, the dominant shapes are the two curving black objects. Um, but the negative shape also figures prominently because it is an implied shape, um, that of the square. The interplay of these elements um, on the picture plane is called the figure ground relationship. Um, this relationship allows us to sort out and interpret what we see. Because we are usually only conditioned to see dominant figures, it takes some mental training to be able to really see the ground or the negative shapes in an artwork. Um, artists have to consider and treat both positive and negative shapes as equally important to the overall composition of a work of art in order for it to be effective. And the last point I'd like to make here is about a specific kind of figure ground relationship. And that's um, illustrated in M.C. Escher's Sky and Water that you see here. This work illustrates a shift in awareness known as the figure ground reversal. This is a kind of game that Escher is playing with us. As our eyes move down the artwork from the top, um, the light upper background um, with dark geese on it um, becomes a dark background with light colored dominant shapes of fish on a black background. So in the middle of the composition here, the fish and the geese are so skillfully interwoven that we aren't sure what's figure and what's ground. And so that exemplifies <clears throat> overall the figure ground reversal. Your book illustrates the element of shape by discussing Paul D'Agostino's supposedly slightly humorous work uh, the rarely glimpsed junk fish. D'Agostino basically creates this rough fish shape out of synthetic clay and mounts it on a pedestal 
So it stands out as a positive three-dimensional organic or biomorphic shape um, against the white background of a wall. He also rendered the junk fish in a drawing, but in the drawing, the fish, it, the fish becomes the negative shape um, against a black background. And another negative space in the composition is meant to indicate the fish's food. We see right here below its mouth. <coughs> so this pair of images was included as an example to illustrate the differences in positive and negative shapes and also to provide you an example of biomorphic or organic shape. Um, but since it's also partially comprised of a three-dimensional object, that leads us right into our next element, which is mass. So while a two-dimensional area is referred to as a shape, a three-dimensional area is referred to as a mass. Unlike a shape, mass has real weight. It's the physical bulk of a solid body of a material. And when a mass encloses space, like a building's dome, for instance, that space is called volume. Um, mass is a significant element in terms of sculpture and architecture. Um, but we're going to talk about both three-dimensional mass and depictions of mass in two dimensions. So here I've just included a few examples that quickly and clearly illustrate the concept of mass and volume. <clears throat> On the left, you'll see land art or earthworks movement pioneer um, Michael Heiser's work, aptly called Levitated Mass from 2012. This piece is on permanent installation at the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and it is simply this massive white boulder that sits hovering over a long sloped walkway that allows viewers to experience the size and weight of the rock as they pass under it. Apparently, it took 11 nights to move the rock through 22 cities from its original location onto the site. Its massive size required road closures and the removal of traffic lights. And on the right, you'll see an interior view of the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica, designed by uh, Michelangelo in the 16th century. Oh, one moment, please. Now, let's look at a few more examples of sculptures that not only hammer in this notion of mass as one of the visual elements, but also that illustrate the difference between closed and open forms. Um, your book includes The Horse by Fernando Botero to depict a massive example of closed form. Um, which is defined as a form that does not openly interact with its surrounding space. This bronze horse serves as a public monument in the city of Mexico, and its bulging limbs are emphasized by a shortened backbone, which draws in um, all four of its legs, um, making it seem more uh, like more architectural almo almost than sculptural. Its body seems inflated beyond realistic proportion, and its head points down, keeping the sight line tucked close to the body. Now, I've included two photographs of colossal Olmec heads that you see in the center here, um, just to give you another example of an artwork that conveys mass and closed form. Although I will say that the sight line of the heads do not lend the sculpture, I mean, it does lend the sculpture a slightly more open form than um, in the horse um, because it, it stares forward 
or straight out rather than down. Um, these Olmec heads are usually carved from these um, large basalt boulders and they range in height from about 4 feet to 11 feet tall. They date roughly from 900 BC and they are these distinct representations of artworks from the Olmec civilization of ancient Mesoamerica. They're thought to represent the heads of influential Olmec rulers. Um, and these depictions are not idealized. They're thought to be portraits. Um, some of them are depicted smiling and others appear more stoic. <clears throat> the Olmecs are generally thought to be the first inhabitants of the Americas to create monumental architecture and the first to develop uh, a sophisticated style of stone sculpture. Um, I've always been partial to these, and so I'm hoping that maybe you'll be interested in them now as well. Um, and now to represent open form, we have a drastically different kind of sculpture by Alberto Giacometti. Uh, it's the man pointing sculpture created in 1947. Uh, this piece depicts a very frail, thin, human figure that gestures with his left hand and points with his right. And we have no idea what he's pointing to or why, but his form interacts with the space around him. Uh, this is therefore an example of an open form. Again, because it interacts with the surrounding space. In this piece specifically, the surrounding space seems to overwhelm the figure, emphasizing that fragile nature of human existence. Now we are at the point of discussing mass in two dimensions. Essentially, because we know that mass is about physical bulk or weight or volume, then it should be evident that mass in two dimensions is only implied. Um, so any quality that a painting or other two-dimensional work of art uh, exhibits that implies or suggests or emphasizes the idea of physical weight can be discussed as the element of mass. Paula Motorson Becker's painting Mother and Child implies mass. Not only do the two figures appear plump and curvaceous, um, via the shading that conveys this bulging, curving flesh, but the figures also fill most of the picture plane. So these two qualities function to create a sense of mass in two dimensions in this composition. Um, the black and white print on the left achieves a similar effect. This work, uh, titled Bread, by Elizabeth Catlett achieves the visual effect of mass via the use of line. Um, <clears throat> we discussed this was one of the potential um, uses of line earlier. Um, so this work exemplifies the use, the, the pictorial use of line um, manipulated in such a skillful way as to convey a sense of the little girl's round features. <clears throat> the next element that we're going to talk about is space. Space is often touted as the most fundamental of the visual elements of art and design. It refers to the distances or areas around, between, and within uh, components of a work of art. Space can be positive, negative, open, closed, shallow, or deep. Architects build space, painters imply it, photographers capture it, and sculptures, uh, sculptors rather, rely on space and form. The architect Frank Lloyd Wright once said that space is the breath of art. Space is the breath of art. And what he meant was that space is found in nearly every piece of art created, unlike some of the other elements of art. 
Some might say that defining space and controlling it um, with the other visual elements is what making art is all about. Your book describes space as the indefinable general receptacle of all things. Um, this work is called Christina's World and it's by Andrew Wyeth and it may look familiar to you. It's a very well-known American painting from the mid 20th century that depicts a woman in the middle of this treeless field <clears throat> looking up at a gray house on the horizon line. Wyeth depicts the appearance or illusion of this vast open space in the picture plane through the use of atmospheric perspective, which we'll discuss in more detail in a little bit. But first, we're going to discuss space in three dimensions. As your book so poignantly declares, um, space is somewhat difficult to convey with words and pictures, especially when it comes to actual three-dimensional space. You must be in it to truly understand it. This is because we experience space as a relationship between our bodies and the people, objects, and surfaces around us. Um, architects are particularly concerned with the qualities of space. Um, the sizes of rooms and hallways, the height of ceilings, the ease of entering and exiting each living area um, must carefully match the function of a building. Architects have to consider the number of people who will occupy a space and the amount of activity that will occur there. The outside of a building is experienced as mass and space, but the inside is experienced as volume. Remember the photograph of uh, the interior of St. Peter's Basilica that I showed a few minutes ago? Um, well, your book highlights Cesar Pelli's design for the North Terminal at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. Um, its massive windows allow passengers a view of its runways, the Potomac River, and the Washington Monument, but the large space also has a subtle domestic feel because it's divided into smaller modules or these semi-enclosed spaces that break up the huge scale of the interior. Pelly took the passenger's experience of the space into account. I've also included a photograph of the interior of Wingspread, um, a Frank Lloyd Wright house um, designed for the president of Johnson Wax that was completed in 1939. The large interiors showcase uh, many of the elements common to Wright's designs, a central uh, fireplace, uh, five in this case, skylights, clear story windows, and huge open spaces filled with natural light. The lack of distinction or walls between spaces or this open floor plan is also characteristic of his designs, um, as well as these dramatic uh, vertical and horizontal elements. Your book also mentions an interest, uh, an interesting contemporary work by Doug Wheeler that you can read more about that creates the feeling of infinite space within a closed space. He relies heavily on light to foster that optical environment. So for now though, we're gonna move on to depictions of space in two dimensions. Um, in con contrast to sculptural and architectural works, we don't have to move around or inside the work to understand depictions of space in drawings or paintings. Instead, the picture plane, and therefore the actual space of the work of art, is usually limited to the dimensions of height and width. But within the picture plane, artists can create a variety of implied spaces. However, in this ancient Egyptian wall painting, um, Pool in the Garden, you'll notice that there is no indication of depth. This is probably because depicting realistic images was not a primary concern of artists working in that area. Their goal was to clearly illustrate particular objects. So the objects in this work are portrayed from easily identifiable angles. 
avoiding the complex visual strategies that would have been required to overlap the objects and diminish their size. Um, the complexity or confusion that these artists tried to avoid actually makes it somewhat more complicated for our highly trained eyes to understand. The pool is depicted from above and the trees and the animals are depicted from the side and their orientations seem a bizarre choice as well. Um, this diagram uh, illustrates some of the tools used for implying depth. I remember practicing how to draw bubble letters when I was a kid and being so frustrated with how they looked until I learned how to implement the overlapping technique. Um, the illusion of depth is heightened considerably by combining overlapping with diminishing size. Another pictorial technique is vertical placement. Objects placed low on the picture plane appear to be closer to the viewer, and those placed higher on the picture plane are farther away. By combining the techniques outlined in um, A through C, uh, overlapping, vertical placement, and diminishing size, you can achieve an even more convincing effect of depth. So let's think about these techniques by comparing these two images. Keep in mind that the viewer may be conscious of a picture's actual flat surface and the illusion of depth. Um, artists can emphasize either the reality or the illusion, or they might strike a balance between the extremes. So here on the left, we have Paul Cezanne's Still Life with Apples from 1890. The artist suggested depth in various ways. Um, we see the horizon line of the tabletop on either side of the fruit, but the artist leaves a curious gap in the middle. We understand pictorial depth by the overlapping and vertical placement of the fruit. The lemon is closer to us and lower on the picture plane than any of the other fruits. The artist flattened the overall space by including patches of parallel brush strokes on the table and behind the group of fruit on the wall. So the space behind the tabletop is unclear. We don't know if the table is flush with the wall behind it or whether it's several feet away. Saison intentionally creates this ambiguous viewing experience consistent with his experimental approach at this time to painting. Um, and this, this piece overall is characteristic of his work, um, exemplified by the repetitive uh, explorations of the brushstroke and the, the way he built form with color. I need some water, please, excuse me. On the right, we see a piece by a 13th century artist called Six Persimmons. In this work, the artist only suggests uh, subtly any depth. <clears throat> In fact, the two uh, persimmons that appear uh, most centrally um, would seem completely flat if they were depicted individually. But because there are some elements of overlap, combined with the device of uh, vertical placement that I mentioned before, we perceive that the arrangement of fruit does have some depth, but the persimmons appear against a pale background that works as a flat surface <coughs> and as an infinite space. So the shapes punctuate the open space of the ground. It isn't actually clear how this artist um, wanted us to read the picture plane either. So let's move on to the uh, more advanced techniques for depicting space. In general, um, perspective means a point of view. In terms of the visual arts, perspective is any means of representing three-dimensional objects in space on a two-dimensional surface. Um, we're going to focus our attention on linear perspective, a system invented in ancient Rome and perfected during 15th century Italy at the beginning of the Renaissance for creating the illusion of depth on a flat surface. Uh, surface. 
Linear perspective is a system that's based on the way that we actually see. While the process of linear perspective is quite complex, the key observation for understanding it is that parallel lines <coughs> appear to meet in the far distance at a vanishing point. At eye level, it uses either real or suggested lines called orthogonals um, converging on the horizon line at eye level. Uh, in the finished work of art, the artist's eye level becomes the eye level of any potential viewer. Within this system, an entire composition can be constructed from a single fixed position or vantage point, and this is called one-point perspective. Two-point perspective is essentially the same system, but there are two vanishing points on the horizon where lines converge. These receding lines emanate from a geometric object located in the foreground of the picture plane. The diagram illustrates both of these concepts. Your book does a much better job of explaining uh, linear perspective than me. Um, so there's also a video in the book that I encourage you to watch. But now let's look at linear perspective at play in Raphael's The School of Athens. First of all, let me just mention that this work is one of four works of a series that depict the different branches of knowledge. <clears throat> the School of Athens illustrates the philosophy branch. And this is why Plato and Aristotle are the central figures of the composition, although several other Greek philosophers are usually, I mean, are supposedly depicted in there as well. So, back to the depiction of space. This work illustrates the use of one-point perspective, and this is evident because our eyes immediately follow the implied orthogonals of the composition back to the vanishing point. But wait. Instead of the vanishing point, our eyes encounter two central figures. Um, and these figures represent Plato and Aristotle. In addition to placing emphasis on these two figures, linear perspective also requires that each figure is drawn to scale according to its distance from the viewer. This means that closer figures need to appear larger and figures further away need to appear smaller to be convincing. Now, the image on the left shows actual orthogonals laid over the composition, just in case you had any doubts. Um, and the image on the right is one of Raphael's studies for this work of art. You'll notice that the central figures are now lost in the group of figures without the use of linear perspective to focus your attention. <coughs> These two paintings, the left one from your book, um, show a different kind of perspective called atmospheric or aerial perspective. This is a nonlinear means for portraying depth. Instead, the atmosphere in these works is created by close attention to colors and details. If you've ever looked off into the distance at uh, the beach or on the top of a mountain, you may have noticed that as your eye reaches further into the distance, objects become less distinct. They take on a hazy effect. This is because of the increased amount of air, moisture, and dust that accumulate between you and the object of your eyes. These objects also appear to become, to become increasingly blue in hue. The intensity of the color you see diminishes and um, the contrast between the areas of light and dark is reduced as well. <clears throat> in Duran's painting on the left, the colors and the details of the trees, rocks, and figures in the foreground um, all work to balance out the hazy, mountainous background. Um, this work provides a sense of vast distances in the North American wilderness. In Friedrich's painting, Wanderer Above the Sea of uh, Fog, the setting isn't exactly clear. Um, the sea of fog obscures the actual landscape. Is the figure perched on a rock by the sea? A precipice of a mountaintop? Um, as our eyes move around the picture plane, the background becomes predominantly white or very light blue. The figure has his back turned away from the viewer. Um, the ambiguity of this setting and the obscured figure 
lend this composition a mysterious haunting quality enhanced by the foggy atmosphere. I also wanted to mention that your book suggests that the Western tradition of depicting atmosphere quite realistically is not the only way. For example, in traditional Chinese landscapes, um, mountains or other landforms are presented more symbolically or even poetically than they are true to form. Rather than drawing the viewer's eye into the landscape, these traditional Chinese works enc encourage the viewer to peer across the space. So across and not into. <clears throat> so what about time in art? How can time be depicted in art if it is itself invisible? Time is this non-spatial continuum or fourth dimension in which events occur in succession. Um, artists may not be able to depict time, um, but it can be made perceptible in art. For instance, several non-Western cultures teach that time is cyclic rather than linear. The Aztecs believed that the earth would periodically end and then begin again. Their calendar represents this idea. The circular shape of the calendar symbolically reinforces their perception of time. The Judeo-Christian traditions underpinning Western culture teaches that time is always moving forward. It's always progressing in a linear fashion. In the work on the left, the meeting of uh, St. Anthony and St. Paul, the early Renaissance painter Sassetta depicts the passage of time in a linear fashion. This is evident because it shows the progression of one figure at different key points in time during his journey from the city into the wilderness and back through a clearing where he meets St. Paul. The road that he travels on implies this forward movement of time. The advent of photography filled the desire to stop time, in a way. Um, initially, only static, inanimate objects could be photographed, but due to improvements in the process, uh, eventually human sitters, sitting very still at first, could be photographed, and then eventually even a galloping horse could be photographed by the end of the 19th century. Technological advances in the 20th century allowed photographers to photograph infinitely more quickly, and that resulted in highly impressive images that captured slices, or that capture slices or moments of time, like this milk splash by Harold Edgerton from 1936. Ultimately, there are many ways to suggest the passage of time or the element of time in works of art. Your book features a few more examples in this section that mention comic strips and videos, so check those out if you're interested. Now, that image of the milk splash almost seems like it should be discussed in terms of motion as well, our next element, but we're going to highlight a few other works instead. Motion is a visual element that many artists seek to depict in order to give their artworks a sense of dynamism or movement. And we're going to discuss two different kinds of motion, implied and actual. Implied motion depicts a feeling of movement without any actual moving parts. A sense of motion can be portrayed um, by actual or implied changes in position. For instance, the dancing Krishna figure uh, portrays the Hindu god as a playful child who just got into his mother's butter supply and dances a victory dance to celebrate. <clears throat> this is supposedly a well-known Hindu tale. I had to dig into that because the figure doesn't appear to be holding anything, um, much less butter. Uh, but anyway, the energetic positions of the arms and legs of the figure allow it to be read as if it might launch into motion at any second. Your book includes Boccione's Dynamism of a Cyclist to further illustrate uh, implied motion. But I've always been partial to the painting you see here by Giacomo Balla called Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash from 1912. This painting depicts a dachshund on a leash and the feet of the lady walking it. Both are in rapid motion, evident by the blurring and multiplication of their parts uh, or their feet and the little doggy's tail.
actual motion is pretty self-explanatory. Actual motion in works of art means that there are actual moving parts, such as in Alexander Calder's Mobiles. His moving sculptures are in this category of artworks called um, kinetic sculptures, an apt category since kinetic signifies motion. Calder's kinetic sculptures rely on the movement of the air around them. They move in response to that air. Now let's talk about light. Uh, without it, we would not see anything. Every single thing that we see is made visible by light. It can be directed, reflected, refracted, diffracted, or diffused. Um, the source, color, intensity, and direction of light greatly affect the way that things appear. The way light falls influences how we see the subject. Um, <clears throat> Daniel Chester French photographed the head of the sculpture of Abraham Lincoln from the Lincoln Memorial um, in DC. He photographed it at the time when it was being installed. And what he saw um, was that the sunlight reflected from the floor uh, at the monument made Lincoln seem like a frightened man. This problem was corrected by the addition of a few spotlights coming from above. And what we see as a result is an intimidating man, a powerful man uh, with a strong brow. These images also illustrate the concept of value or tone uh, in a way relative lightness and darkness of surfaces. <clears throat> um, th this concept is particularly evident here because we know that this sculpted head is the same exact piece, but the light affects the value or tone of it uh, rather than the differences uh, being the effect of a different pigment or material. Now, the diagram at the top here, um, in simple terms, uh, illustrates the idea of value uh, that I mentioned in the last slide. Again, value is perceived as a relationship rather than um, an isolated form. You can see that the gray line in the center of the diagram is one color, but its effect changes based on what surrounds it. It appears to change from one end to the other, but the value of the background is what actually changes. Um, your book illustrates this relationship <clears throat> or this concept um, by discussing the self-portrait that you see on the left um, in which the artist sat in a dark room with only one light source. The technique he used depicting himself by shading from light to dark is called chiaroscuro. This is an Italian word in which chiaro means light and oscuro means dark. <coughs> This technique creates the illusion um, that figures have roundness and bulk. And the painting on the right is an incredible illustration of how implied light creates striking visual interest in the chiaroscuro style. This piece is called The Taking of the Christ and it's by the artist Caravaggio, one of the most well-known practitioners of chiaroscuro. His works are known for the very dramatic contrast between light and dark. Now, your book also talks about the use of actual light in works of art. Some artists use artificial lights as their medium. Uh, this work is called Electric Superhighway by Korean, art, Korean artist Nam Joon Paik, and it's this 51 channel video installation that is in the shape of the United States and neon light uh, outlines the monitors, evoking the idea of motel lights and restaurant signs that can be seen along the interstates or highways of the country. Paik was actually the first person to use this phrase, electronic superhighway, because he was aware in 1995, when the installation was created, that Americans shared this connection through electronic media. Um, the work also suggests that North American identity has always been heavily influenced by film and television. Um, so be sure to check out the other examples in your book by Paul Chan and Keith Sonier. 
um, who's also highlighted in one of the creators sections of your book. Now we're just going to hit the high notes about the visual element of color. Your book goes into great detail about it. I think it is uh, one of the elements that we understand quite intuitively, but perhaps it's wrong for me to assume this. <clears throat> So I encourage you to read this section about color closely if you are quite interested in it. Now, color is actually a component of light. And this component affects us psychologically. It influences our moods, our thoughts, our actions, and possibly even our health. Um, think about what they say about painting your room blue. It can be calming to some people, but it might deepen the depression for someone who is already prone to sadness. We often express ourselves with color as well. We dress ourselves according to our color preferences every day. Um, some of the different associations we have with colors vary across cultures. The color red might um, be a symbol of love to us, but in South Africa, red is the color of mourning. In our culture, green often indicates jealousy, but yellow is the color that indicates jealousy in Germany. Yellow indicates betrayal, weakness, contradiction um, in French culture. And blue, as I mentioned before, blue is commonly associated with melancholy in Western cultures. But it signifies safety and protection in some Middle Eastern uh, cultures. So we have this general concept that color affects us psychologically and how it has and can be used to affect us in that way. But how does it work? Well, um, I'm sure all of you remember this from science class, but um, what we know as color is actually the effect of light waves on our eyes. Objects that appear to have color are merely reflecting the colors that are present in the light that illuminates them. This diagram, oh, there is no diagram here. <laughs> I've mixed some things up, students, I apologize. This diagram illustrates um, how Newton discovered that white light is composed of all the cover colors of the spectrum. Um, so let's look at a few uh, key terms. Achromatic um, means without the property of hue. Um, achromatic colors are black, white, and the combination of those two, which is gray. Um, these colors are uh, often referred to as neutrals. And um, colors are distinguishable from, uh, the different types of colors are distinguishable from three variables. And those are hue, um, which indicate a particular wavelength of spectral color, for instance, green. Um, and value, which is the relative lightness or darkness of an image, which we've already hinted at. Um, and also know that adding black to a hue produces a shade and adding white produces a tint. Um, and then we have intensity or saturation, um, which indicates the purity of a hue. So the purest hue is the most intense, uh, intense form of the color. Um, adding white or black dulls that intensity. Now, this image depicts a color chart shown in the three dimensions of color. Basically, what you see are the primary hues delineated by ones, secondary hues delineated by twos, and tertiary hues marked by threes. Primaries cannot be created by intermixing uh, any of the other hues. Secondaries can be created with a mixture of two primaries and tertiary hues can be found between the primary and secondary hues of which it is composed. Uh, color is sometimes described in terms of temperature, and that's what these two circles indicate. The red-orange hues on one side of the color wheel are thought to be warm, and the blue-green hues on the other side are thought to be cool. Um, and I think most of these things are ideas that you are already familiar with. But if you want to look more deeply into color theory, I'm going to provide the link to a video um, in the description of this video. Um, so check that out later. Um, now, identifying color schemes may be a more manageable jumping off point for delving into the topic of color and how it works on the picture plane. 
In Mary Corse's untitled work on the left, um, she depicts one of her characteristically white paintings in the monochromatic scheme. Um, Jennifer Bartlett's Path exemplifies the analogous color scheme, or one that contains colors that each contain the same uh, pure hue. Uh, so the colors in this work come from the blue, blue-violet, and blue-green section of the color wheel. And Keith's Herring, uh, and Keith Herring's rather, um, untitled Square Head with Three Eyes is an example of a complementary color scheme. Uh, red and green are completely opposite each other on the color wheel. So our last visual element to discuss is texture. In the visual arts, texture refers to the tactile qualities of surfaces uh, or the visual representation of those qualities. So actual textures can be felt and they're often included in sculptural and architectural works. Simulated or implied textures are created to look like something other than print. Um, Merritt Oppenheim's object, uh, Breakfast in Fur, from 1936 is a classic example artwork used to indicate texture. It's described as a rude tactile experience in your textbook, um, and this is because of its confounding uh, contradictory design. While the fur is soft and pleasant to the touch of the hand, the idea of consuming liquids out of a fur-covered cup and touching one's tongue to that furry surface is disturbing to the senses. Um, your book also mentions Giacometti's band pointing here um, to suggest that the eroded surface of the figure adds to um, the kind of existential crisis or emotional impact of the piece. Um, so Frank is also suggesting that texture can affect our emotions uh, in addition to our senses. He also illustrates this point by discussing the classic beauty that is Van Gogh's Starry Night, uh, suggesting that the thick brush strokes of paint um, that make up the textural rhythms of the night sky convey intense feelings. Um, its rich tactile surface is used as an expressive device. Um, so that wraps up our talk about the visual elements. Now we need to um, discuss the last few sections of chapter one so that you'll be fully prepared to tackle the assignments for this module. So. We're going to talk about uh, these three terms that I mentioned before when we went over our objectives. Um, and these three terms are about the relationship between works of art and reality. So the first of those terms is representational art. Um, so if we break down the word representational, what we end up with is represent or um, you could interpret that as present again. And what we would be presenting again are the people, places, and objects from our observable realities. Now, if humans are the primary subjects depicted in a work of art, that is called figurative art. Um, and remember that um, objects that are represented in works of art are actually called subjects. Um, one way to really uh, absorb or understand what representational art is, is to take a look at trompe l'oeil paintings. Now, um, trompe l'oeil is a French term that was coined in the 17th century during the era of Baroque art, and what it means is to fool the eye. Um, it is a highly illusionistic style of painting that looks so real that the viewer is deceived into thinking that a painting is actually a three-dimensional object um, and that the work of art is actually the thing itself rather than a painting. Two common types of trompe l'oeil painting include architectural and easel painting. Architectural uh, creates the optical illusion of high ceilings um, or maybe even the effect of looking into the sky from within a structure. Um, and easel painting creates the illusion of depth in the picture plane. 
um, which means that an object, or which means that the picture plane might appear to recede back into a room, or it may appear that a figure of a painting is jutting out at the viewer. So one example of an architectural trompe l'oeil work is this one by the artist Andrea Mantegna, and it was painted in the latter half of the 15th century. Um, the perspective isn't quite perfect yet, but it's still an impressive work, um, and it's generally referred to as the ceiling oculus. Um, and it's, it's kind of a proto-trompe l'oeil because it isn't 100% worked out. Um, and you'll notice that the oculus is actually a small part of the ceiling. The rest is covered with these architectural elements um, and these arches here. But um, that was just a test because those are actually just elements of trompe l'oeil as well. These architectural elements and the arches are just created out of paint. <clears throat> and these works of art, um, trompe l'oeil I mean, often have a bit of humor. Um, so looking back at the oculus, you'll see that there appears to be a large potted plant supported only by a thin bar. And so the idea is that what if it's removed, then that pot might fall on your head. So this kind of humor underpins the tone behind a lot of this kind of art. Um, it's kind of like a game that the artist plays with the viewer to raise questions about the nature of art and perception. Um, your book uses William Harnett's work, A Smoke Backstage, to illustrate the concept of trompe l'oeil. And because the objects are depicted pretty true to size, the illusion uh, is even more convincing. So continuing with this idea that artists often question how we perceive <clears throat> and how they look, uh, how they can alter our perceptions, look at this work by Belgian artist René Magritte. What do you see? If you said pipe, I want you to know that the text at the bottom of this picture plane translates to, this is not a pipe. So why would Magritte want to do this? Well, it's precisely because he wanted to highlight that the work of art um, was actually a painting and not a pipe. Um, of course, the viewer already knows this, but this kind of visual game does illustrate how art, um, or at least it can emphasize how art can be um, deceptive and persuasive and convincing and manipulative. Um, the takeaway is, oh, well, first of all, let me tell you, the name of this artwork translates to the treachery of images. So anyway, be aware that the work of art is this highly constructed uh, object, despite its appearance or similarity to objective reality. Particularly important to remember um, later with the topic of photography. And your book invites you to think even further or deeper about this relationship between representational art to reality um, by introducing Ray Beldner's piece called <clears throat> This is Definitely Not a Pipe. Not only does Beldner comment on the idea that art um, is not about exactly what you see, um, but he's also commenting on how art is often about money. So, you know, he says, this is definitely not a pipe. So, okay, yeah, it's not uh, always, it's definitely not the object itself. Um, and it may not even be about the work of art itself, um, but it may simply be understood in terms of monetary value. So, uh, artists depict generally a lot more than what they see. They select, arrange, and compose bits of reality instead. Now, what about abstract art? 
in the art world, abstract has two definitions. One of them uh, means a work of art that has no reference to objective reality um, or anything outside of itself. And then the other meaning is that um, it's a work of art that depicts reality in a simplified, distorted, or exaggerated way. Your book defines abstract art as the latter. So <clears throat> abstract artists may alter the appearance of an object in the spirit of experimentation or in order to emphasize or reveal certain aspects of their subject. Sometimes the subject will be obvious um, and other times a further explanation will be required. Sometimes this art, this kind of art can be rather challenging and a clue is often necessary to determine the subject matter. But other times, <coughs> such as in this slide, it's more apparent. These works are easy to place into the context of reality. Um, on the left, you'll see an artistically crafted stool um, made by the Cameroon people of Central Africa in the late 19th, early 20th century. It shows abstraction of the human body and face. Um, this stool was designed to be used by the chief or ruler of these people. Um, but the abstract figures uh, symbolize that the Cameroon people supported their ruler. Um, just because their bodies and faces were not anatomically correct, um, we, we did know, we do know what they represent. Um, and on the right, you'll see one of Picasso's uh, sculptural guitars from 1912. Um, Picasso was playing with tradition in major ways with this work of art. Not only was he experimenting with abstraction by distorting the appearance of the instrument, um, but also he was experimenting with a medium. Typical materials um, that had been used for sculpture previously were stone, wood, or bronze. And Picasso's work was made of cardboard. So in Theo von Duisburg's Abstraction of a Cow series, you can see that the process of abstraction, <clears throat> uh, you can see what the process of abstraction looks like for one artist. Um, so Duisburg starts with this likeness of a cow. It is believable, it's anatomically correct. Um, we don't know if he used a photograph or if he looked at one in real life, but it looks real, like it was, had a real source. <clears throat> now, she, he breaks it down one step at a time, diminishing the degree of true appearance by subtracting dimension each time. Um, he reduces this work line by line, becoming more simple each time. <clears throat> but at this point, he has added grass. Um, I mean, adds color rather to, to perhaps evoke grass. Um, and finally, the work of art becomes an arrangement of geometric, uh, geometric shapes, uh, rectangles in this case, and then one central square. Um, eventually, it bears no resemblance to the cow. So this case illustrates a situation in which a clue or some kind of background information would have been necessary to identify the abstracted image. Because if we only saw that last image um, with no context, we would probably think that the work was actually uh, non-representational. So that leads us right in there. Um, <clears throat> if representational art depicts the appearance of things, then non-representational art surely means art without things or without a subject more aptly. Um, this kind of art is often created for enjoyment alone or for beauty or visual pleasure or for interest or for experimentation. Um, this kind of art is also uh, sometimes called non-objective or non-figurative. And uh, that's pretty clear why, because it is, there's an absence of objects and an absence of figures. It's about creating forms and patterns that have no specific references outside themselves. Um, 
you can relate to this experience by listening to music. Pure sound has um, no outside references, but we still enjoy it. So non-representational art comes in a wide range of forms, including <clears throat> quilts, <clears throat> Native American textiles, and Islamic art and architecture. Lots of pattern objects are non-representational. But these works of art have the capacity to inspire moods and emotions just as figurative art can, um, but through the visual elements like color, line, and shape. So you're probably familiar, well, we've already mentioned it, with the notion that a blue bedroom might make you sad or a red room might make you um, angry. Well, you know, this is a similar concept. Um, Non-representational arts can affect the emotions. Now, this pair of Egyptian doors from a ma uh, mosque are a solid example of non-objective art. Um, it displays this gorgeous wood carving centered around two 12-sided stars, and these straight lines kind of radiate away, uh, away from these stars, and they overlap with curving, symmetrical designs. Um, and even though there's no story depicted, we can still appreciate the beauty and craftsmanship of works of art like these. Um, now, here is an example of Islamic architecture. This is the Dome of the Rock, which is an elaborately decorated um, shrine, Islamic shrine, located in Jerusalem. It was originally built in the 7th century AD, and it has undergone many changes and restorations through the years. Um, it, is ac it is accepted as one of the oldest works of Islamic architecture. It displays the characteristic use of all over education, um, I mean, I'm sorry, decoration, featuring both vegetal and geometric patterns. Um, and you'll never see uh, figurative Islamic art or you most likely never will, because it is thought to be idolatry to depict figures in Islamic art. Now, the last example from this section is Carmen Herrera's Yellow and Black. It's very different than the two other works we looked at. It's asymmetrical, it's sleek, it's stark. Is it beautiful? I don't know, that's up to you, it's not to me. Um, it may make you think of a lightning bolt um, and it's not uncommon to try to see objects in non-representational art because, again, our brains try to impose order. Um, but Herrera was actually just interested in experimenting with color and shape. And it's also very large, so the energy it exudes would likely be um, quite jolting in person. So non-representational art really encourages us to um, slow down and experience the art um, and focus on how, uh, how line, shape, and color affect us and also to um, notice the mastery of technical skill. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into form and content. Um, and then we'll get back to looking and seeing. So the terms we've been discussing certainly prime our minds for talking about form and content. Um, and please don't stress about all these new terms. Uh, it's going to take practice to get a handle on them. So trust the process. Um, so what is form? Well, it's the total effect or product of the combined visual qualities within a work of art. So it's the materials, it's the colors, it's the shapes, it's the line, it's the design. Now, content is the meaning or the message of a work of art. Um, and these two concepts are inseparable um, because content determines form and the form expresses the content. Now, um, I included this little house here so you could think about form. What are some of the elements of form of this house? Well, um, the colors are red, white, blue, and yellow. Um, the shapes are rectilinear. Um, we have some more sophisticated shapes here in the rooftop. Um, 
but uh, those are the elements of form. Um, and the content or the subject matter is a house at its most basic. Um, so I just wanted to show you a quick example of that. Um, so, and think of it this way, the form, um, you might think of the form as the clothing that the content wears. Um, now, your book uh, compares and contrasts two different works uh, that express the same content with different forms. On the left is Rodin's version of The Kiss. Um, it features uh, life-size human figures um, uh, who are uh, a male and a female that represent the Western ideal for the body. Um, it captures this sensual moment between two lovers. Flesh appears soft, even though the material used is marble. Um, this is really an example of mastery of form. It's a work that very much feels like we are caught in the moment with the other, uh, with the two figures. It's kind of immediate too, because we might imagine ourselves engaging in such an embrace um, on our own. Now, on the right, Brancusha's version from 1916, um, the figures are abstracted. We don't imagine the moment of embrace when we look at this work. Um, perhaps you do, but that's, you know, to each his own. Um, there is no supple flesh. Um, there is no gesture to imagine. Instead, we identify with the concept of a kiss. Um, we can at least identify that symbolic meaning. And so we have to figure that this abstraction of form was meant to lead us to a point of rumination, of meditation about the idea of solid, lasting love. Um, again, this comparison helps illustrate how much of an impact that form has on our reception of content and interpretation and meaning. Now, just a few things to remember about responding to form. It takes practice um, to train your brain to see these things and then to interpret and talk about it. Um, it just takes time. And consider this. Um, artists put in hard work and effort to create works of art, um, but it often takes effort and creativity um, to respond to works of art, too. Um, the work of the viewer is essentially, um, is essential to the creative process. Um, you know, while some people may create art just for themselves, likely it is created to share. And so without viewers, this is impossible. Um, and lastly, keep in mind that subject matter can interfere with our reception of form. We get trapped in the power of the idea uh, or the narrative. Your book suggests that if you get stuck, to turn an artwork upside down to get a fresh perspective. So, regarding looking and seeing, um, they, these are very important activities when it comes to the visual arts. Um, these terms indicate different degrees of visual awareness. Um, looking is habitual, mechanical, and um, we take it for granted. Uh, looking is about uh, functioning and meeting goals and needs um, and performing tasks. Seeing, however, is beyond this basic activity of looking. It involves a higher level of perception, um, being open, receptive, and focused. Um, when we see, we do so through the lens of our imagination, um, our past events, um, and emotions as well. Um, we, we can learn to appreciate what we see beyond our needs being met. Um, we learn to appreciate their beauty, design, meaning, history, and potential that we might not have seen before. Now, that's how the photographer Edward Weston arrived at this gorgeous photograph of an ordinary bell pepper. Um, to capture this kind of glowing light, um, Weston had to leave the exposure open for 
um, two hours or so, he saw beyond this object's basic function. He saw a graceful, curving form, and he used his technical skills and knowledge to capture his vision. Um, the potential beauty of this pepper. This may seem like hogwash to you, um, but by allowing yourself to see things, ordinary things, um, and people and places in this way, it might open the doors of your perception. Um, the author of your book says that by cultivating the connections between our eyes and our minds and our emotions, we can take better advantage of what art has to offer. So, now we're going to start, um, now we're going to wrap up by talking about iconography. Um, an iconography is a particular range or system of types of images used by artists um, to convey particular meanings. For example, in Christian religious painting, there is an iconography of images such as the lamb, which represents Christ, or the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit. In the iconography of classical myth, the presence of a dove would have suggested that any woman also present would have been the goddess Aphrodite or Venus. Um, so the meanings of particular images can depend on context as well. Iconography, as defined by your book, indicates the subjects, symbols, and motifs used in an image to convey its meaning, specifically those important to particular cultures or religions. Um, so one easy example to illustrate this idea is the images uh, is the image featuring mother and child. Um, art historians and other art connoisseurs would look at such an image and correlate it with Mary and baby Jesus. But not all works contain iconography. This work by Jan van Eyck is frequently used to demonstrate the use of iconography in works of art. Um, but I must give you a disclaimer. The specific meanings and interpretations of this work of art have been debated and contested through the centuries. But we're just going to take a look to practice. Um, each of the objects in this painting has a specific um, meaning here beyond imagery. Um, in fact, this painting might be a um, painted marriage contract um, designed to solidify the agreement between these two families. Um, it's important to remember that this isn't a painting of an actual scene, but an image highly constructed to communicate specific things. Um, you'll notice that the bride holds her garment in front of her belly, and, uh, and, and it makes it appear as though she's pregnant. Um, she wasn't pregnant at the time of the painting, but because this is a symbolic depiction, um, it represents that she will become fruitful. Now, the little dog at her feet is a symbol of fidelity. The discarded shoes are often seen as a symbol of the sanctity of marriage. Um, the single candle lit in the daylight um, during uh, in, in the chandelier here um, is a symbol of the bridal candle, uh, a devotional candle that was to burn all night during the first night of marriage. Um, other interpretations claim that the single candle is a symbol of the presence of God. Um, and the chair back, um, I'm sorry, um, there's an orange on the windowsill here, and uh, it represents um, material wealth. And the circular mirror at the back um, reflects both the artist and another man, um, and the artist's signature even reads Jan van Eyck was present. Um, both are witnesses to the betrothal in the picture. Um, we don't really think much of this anymore, um, but a promise to marry was a legal contract. So those are just a couple of examples 
Um, the dog is a sign of fidelity. The orange is a sign of wealth. Um, depicting um, the female as pregnant to, to mean pregnancy to come. Um, sho shoes also as a uh, symbol of the sanctity of marriage. So um, there is more than meets the eye um, when it comes to paintings. Um, and many of them are rife with images uh, or examples of iconography. So now I want you to, um, oh, I forgot that I included this one. You can look at that one in your book. Um, so now think about uh, what is the definition of iconography? And I want you to identify at least two American iconographic uh, signs or symbols that are recognizable by most Americans. And then explain the cultural meaning of these iconographic signs or symbols.